does that at a show create more empathy for the animal or not? And is the answer positive or negative? Either side of that, because even a no could be a positive or negative and a plus could be a positive. It's not about understanding, it's about power. A, a, uh, when there's a vacuum of knowledge or resources, there's always a drive to fill that. I got you two guys because you're both so dedicated to one really specific type of animal, one specific type of reptile, and you guys actually have really good business sense in my mind, or at least you're going that way. I mean, who can say that about Bill? Like, that's... I... <laughs> Bill, I want to thank you personally. Uh, there's, there's a saying in the world, and you and Ryan McVeigh have done this for me. Like you guys have proven this to be true. Um, what is it? It's the measure of a man is how he treats people that can't do a damn thing for him. All right. And you and you and McVeigh have been wonderful. Just outstanding supportive caring just wonderful people and i really appreciate that uh, i did an episode of reptile fight club okay and it was you know our is this hobby for the keeper or the the kept and he he, he asked me a question where do you fit in herpaculture it's like, well, there's so many things that I can do, but I'm really just getting started. And so listening to your podcast on the business side of it really got me like, okay, what could I possibly do that's different? And I have actually studies in like nonverbal human communication. I did a, what kind of, or a, I did a quantitative and qualitative study on the uh, turnover rate for fast food. So I've actually yeah. done studies and it's not like this is, and I've, I've learned about empathy through years of, of just learning about different things. And I love neuroscience and stuff like that. So it's like, what if I did this? So I was talking to Rex Kluberit. We got on and we were talking and it, it led me down a different path. And then that path led me somewhere else. And then that path led me somewhere else. And so then I've read other things and we'll talk about that a little bit after the, like the initial part, but it's, it's been wonderful. Every time I have somebody on, they're always amazing. I always have a huge blast. So I hope you guys do too. And, uh, I just want to thank you. I mean, for the audience, Bill's to blame for this for this podcast. Bill's to blame. He's like, yeah, <laughs> he. And that's the thing. I, 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 the the lady that I was talking about from Quebec, Canada, who is actually a therapist, who's kind of been talking to me. So she'll she'll like that I had a shout out to her a little bit. She wrote me a paper, literally a a on every single one of my videos, her ideas and thoughts. And one of the things is that every topic that I've done so far, even the stuff outside of herbiculture could be taken, even outside of the psychological studies, can be taken even farther. And that's exactly the idea. Like that's exactly, you can't do everything through one interview on, and then you have to be careful about what you do on YouTube anyways. Like you, you don't want to show too much like to the world there's just some things that are probably off limits for that and you got to take in your guests for instance you don't want to make them look bad you don't want all these different things you want everybody to have fun and so i just love that like you you left you left stuff out there for us to learn and develop and so that's what i'm hoping to do here with these studies and stuff. Let's leave something on the bone so that somebody else can come along and actually work on it. Even, uh, even if I'm proven wrong on any of my hypothesis, I'm thrilled like that. I would love that if somebody came along and used my hypothesis and disproved them because that gives us a better understanding of who we are in this herbiculture that gives us a way better understanding as people and i love that oh man do i love that 
Like it's just like yes. Like I'm I'm great at being proven wrong, but prove me wrong. Don't just tell me I'm wrong. If you think okay. I'm wrong, why? So now I was telling uh, Bill here her time that about your jars. Right. They're yeah, they're that's that's a wonderful idea. And just and uh, I just got two uh the Nidanoles. Right. And they they have calmed down from that first night. Yeah, it's I at first I'm like, am I really gonna enjoy these guys? And then it's like, oh, oh crap. Yeah, like I think I might. They're I think once I get out of this apartment and get them properly set up in a proper enclosure. And I've got the enclosure. I'm just doing the the stuff to make sure they're they're okay and getting out of this apartment stuff. So, well, actually, I'm very interested. Armin, what are these jars? So the jars, uh, their their original purpose is a sprouting jar. So like people that want to grow microgreens to put in their smoothies mm -hmm. or something like like vegan stuff. I guess I'm not vegan, so I wouldn't know. But there are these, uh, they're probably 10 inches tall, four inches uh, diameter. Um, and they have a screen top. So that's how I house the babies individually. Uh, since okay. the baby and the they hatch out like less than an inch. And I, if I can, I try to keep them separate from each other. Um, because the gnolls, they lay one egg at a time. Uh, so none of the babies are truly the same size. So if one's larger than the other, there can be some mm -hmm. bullying issues or food competition issues. So that's kind of one way I developed to keep them separated. Um, and then I would also take the jars and sell the babies in them at reptile shows. And the jars would be kind of, you know, planted with a little twig for the baby to hang out on so that not only does it look better at a show rather than yeah. just sitting in a jelly cup on paper towel, but if someone doesn't have a setup ready, the baby can live in the, as long as they have sufficient um, misting and food and some UV, they can still live in the jar for some time until the, the new owner has something totally set up for it. Oh, I like that idea better than having a cage filled with 10 babies. Yeah, it yeah. gets complicated, so... I mean, you probably, I mean, if you're catching out chameleons. As a no chameleon babies, guy, yeah. Babies all going I respect food. this. <laughs> yeah. I love this idea. And we'll come back to that after after the initial stuff, because I have a question, and I'm going to put it on, on uh, the community tab. And I don't even know if I want an answer necessarily. I just want people to think. And so we'll get to that then. But uh, how I always start these out is I ask one of you guys to tell a story and then the other one asks a question afterwards about that story. That's how we start. Cool. Who would like to start? The only, the only thing, just be as detailed as you can. The story is completely yours to tell. Bill, I think you can take it. You're, you're more uh, proficient in podcasting, so I think you might be a better. A story. Yeah. Anything you want. Uh, not, it, what kind of story are we looking for here? You tell me. And I know that's a that's a pretty big thing, but just first thing that comes to your mind, there is no wrong answer here. There is absolutely no wrong answer. The actual more you are yourself, the actual more helpful you are to the study. Well, I will say one thing that was a learning experience. Back when I was a wee lad, well, actually just out of college, uh, and I was very interested in carnivorous plants, and I loved unique plants, and Mimosa pudica, the sensitive plant, was one of my favorites, and that is, uh, it looks uh, like a little fern-like, but if you touch it, the leaves close up. Movement in plants, very entertaining for me, and I loved it, fascinated with it, but boy, it was so hard to uh, to raise this plant and keep it healthy. Of course, I know now it just needed more humidity and uh, and higher temperatures because it's it, uh, it comes from the tropical areas. Uh, but you know, there is still figuring it out, and it was 
Um, it was impactful when, uh, with me treating each one of these as though they were precious and putting all that attention towards just keeping it alive to where I uh, took a trip down to Costa Rica. And oh, I love that. And then, uh, especially the day that I was walking up to a, the lodge that we were gonna stay at on the uh, Caribbean side. And there was this vast expanse of a lawn that you had to walk through a path to get there. And I realized this vast expanse was not grass. It was all mimosa pudica. And uh, that is how, uh, that was, uh, that is an experience of how uh, uh, one person's treasure is another person's weed. Yeah. That's super cool. Do you have so, a question for him? So a question I may ask about that is, did you, when you saw that and you realized it was a sensitive plant, a lawn of sensitive plant, did you revisit trying to keep it or were you past that stage in your life? Or had you already been successful at keeping it before then? Uh, I actually, by that time, uh, I was very much, I was able to do more with, uh, with reptiles. Uh, I had been with working with reptiles for a long time, but uh, I was really deeply into it. And by that time, I realized that Mimosa pudica actually has thorns when you take care of it well. And uh, that didn't fit in well with my uh, reptile keeping terrarium. So uh, yeah, I went ahead and uh, just chalked that up into, well, this is interesting. Cool. As you think, as you think about your story, Herb Time, um, I bought monkey pot plants, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, so I didn't exactly know what they were. It's like this really looks really cool, and the leaves are really strong, and I could put it with my emerald green tree skinks, and they would be able to climb it because the leaves were really strong, and. When I got home, I looked it up so I could understand the care requirements better. Oh, it's a carnivorous plant that actually in the bulbs can eat birds sometimes. It's like, yeah, maybe I don't put that in with the emeralds now. Maybe not. Maybe that's probably a good idea to, to pass on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we actually love using Nepenthes with the uh, chameleons. Uh, very rarely. Do those uh, those uh, pictures get big enough to be of a uh, concern to an adult panther chameleon, at least? But, but uh, yes, yeah, in fact, if you get it to uh, adult size, those pictures big enough to where they're a, uh, a a threat, you've really done something right with your uh, the pethies, <laughs> and that's a bragging right right there. Yeah, I don't think th I don't think they made it for too long. I tried to feed the bugs that I've got running around this apartment to it. Okay. Yeah, I tried to use it for a good rig of cause, but no, it didn't quite work out. Well, I guess a story I can tell. Uh, I get kind of going off of both of your stories about the plants. Um, similarly, that was kind of my beginning, and unfortunately, a lot of people's beginnings with the lizards I work with, like a knolls. So I had probably when I was, before I was even like eight or nine years old, I had gotten some and just like you guys with the plants, you don't know exactly what you're doing and you're doing your best, but you didn't do the right research or you didn't do something correct and you lose your, um, lose the plant or the animal or something. And that's what happened with me with my first annuls. And uh, but then that was, uh, and then probably a year later, I, got some more i mean by this time i'm only nine years old and i would go to petco and they're seven dollar lizards so i got more and i had done some more research i had gotten a few books that my parents let me get and i was actually successful in those were the first lizards i got eggs from successful i had bread guppies and all sorts of other live bearing stuff before but that was the first time i ever got eggs from anything so that was super cool and i think uh just to go towards everyone else's kind of idea, especially yours, Bill, that um, now, you know, over a decade and a half later, I 
have fallen such in love with the genus of Anolis that I have so many other so many other species of them that um, a lot of people when they first hear oh you breed Anolis they only think of the brown and the green Anolis because that's mm-hmm. all people know but they don't know there's over 400 species not including subspecies localities morphs all that stuff so it's like you said one man's trash is another man's treasure and that's how I see it with the Knowles and luckily for me I've been able to prove to a lot of people that they are a treasure worth keeping uh, and that's, that's my story yeah you know I would say even the green anole the Carolina anole that thing is a gorgeous lizard yeah and so calling I, I know it's when things are so common it skews our ability to appreciate beauty that's a very strange uh, characteristic of human beings is we're, yeah. we're blind to what's in front of us. Definitely. And, and, and the rarity seems to be more valuable to us than intrinsic beauty. It's a very yeah. strange thing. Yeah. yeah, that is how we tend to work. And it is strange because besides the chameleon, there's no other co- lizard that's that colorful really that's readily available and Mm -hmm. when you go and you actually do like 10 minutes of research you realize they're not hard to take care of at all and they're a great beginner lizard as well so yeah so bill do you have a question for him um was that first one that you had was it the carolinus Uh, am i saying that right carolinus Carolinensis. Yes, and yeah. Carolinensis. Was it a Carolinensis? <laughs> I'd have butchered yeah. that. Yeah, it was, yes, it was a native green anole. That's the only anole native to the United States, uh, even though we, there's probably a dozen invasive species. Do you um, still keep Carolinensis? Yeah, I do. I have some literally right in front of me. The only difference is the ones I have a male that is like an exanthic, like a blue. Uh, oh, so, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, but the females are all normals, so hopefully I can. Apparently, in Tampa, there's a population of this gene, and it's co-dominant. So we'll see if I can prove them out and have some more blue babies. That would be mm-hmm. super cool. But yes, I do. Yeah. With the Carolinensis. And now, uh, by the way, the first chameleon I had was a Jackson's chameleon, and uh, I've never been without. Uh, very few times have I ever been without a Jackson's chameleon. I, th- I think that way about my beardies, but it's, I think if I ever lose like the three of them, I'll probably get more just even though I don't like, I, it's absolutely nothing I want right now. I do not want another beardy, but if I lost my beardies, I just think I, I just have to get another one. Like it's just no way I could just be without, I, I fully understand. Now for the audience, I work for bear crop science. I am an actual scientist, polymer chemist. I worked on things like uh, the uh, protein twisting and friggin' uh, like how to target cancer cells and Zika and Ebola and stuff like that. So I'm a pretty educated guy and I understand how to take care of plants and stuff. And I still lose them. Like, it's still, like, I still do it. Like, it still dies on me. I'm like, ah, crap. And I understand what I'm doing. But there's a huge difference between doing and understanding. A guy like Peyton Manning probably doesn't understand the the real physics behind throwing a football. But yet, a physicist probably can't throw a football like Peyton Manning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, it's yeah. a, it's an important notice, but yeah. So it sounds really easy, and it's like crap. I've killed hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, I've yep, yep. I've done the impossible. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this next question, uh, we're testing creativity. So why don't you guys tell us the most creative thing that you've come up with? In regards to reptiles or ever? You tell me because I don't understand what your perception of creativity is. So this also helps us understand that. Because if if we can get more on the same perception of the world, I think we'd be better off. Right. Or, Or at least understand that other people have different perceptions than we do. Right. Well, I can... 
I can throw something out there and then <laughs> go ahead. Uh, there is no wrong answer. Perhaps my uh, my integration of the different digital outreach methods into the Chameleon Academy to where I've combined a website with podcasts, uh, embedded podcast episodes, embedded YouTube episodes, uh, as well as PDF uh, uh, handouts to the point where with the the intention being that it would be a multimedia experience, so it would uh, it would serve people that have multiple learning styles. You can read, you can listen, you can watch. And, cool. and that has been super impressive. I was I was actually bringing up the other day when somebody was talking about hermit crabs. I was like, okay, so Chameleon Academy does this. Like if you get an enclosure, so this is the exact steps to change that, that enclosure to a proper enclosure that you would buy at a pet store. Like that's like you don't have to sit here and ask a bunch of questions. This is just it. I'm like, what what if you guys could figure that out for hermit crabs? Like that's that would be fa I mean, I think he's like it's a little harder because the the really the difference in what they give you for what a hermit crab is set up in to what a hermit crab should be set up in is so vastly different that it's, it's, it's hard to do that, but it's, yes, yes. it's a wonderful idea and I have the utmost respect for you for it. Okay. Thank you. Um, one, cr I mean, I don't know if I've done anything to up to Bill's standard of creativity, but I was just thinking of like straight up, like artistic creativity. When I was younger, I, uh, would turn a lot of different things into enclosures and fish tanks. Cause I couldn't, in high, in middle school and high school, I couldn't always afford to go buy the brand new, uh, four hundred dollar giant Zoomed terrarium. Mm -hmm. So, one example that I thought was cool, um, I have a picture somewhere. I'd have to dig it up. But I turned a old TV into a fish tank. Oh, I yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. So I had a, I had, I found the old TV on the side of the road, and then I had an old fish tank with one panel uh had cracked so i literally smashed out the back of the tv used the front um viewing panel i guess you'd call it of the tv or the monitor whatever uh as the front panel took out the bad panel just got some silicone from home depot put it together and i have a picture of it with goldfish in there i had that thing running for a few years so there's just lots of examples like even now i've i mean instead of having someone come in and custom build enclosures for me, I mean, my friends are the ones building a ton of huge enclosures. Um, like for example, my croc monitor, he has a huge like 12 by seven by eight foot enclosure that I have um, here and uh, built it all by hand, did all the cement background by hand, brought in a huge like 14 foot log, me and my friend, like five of us drug in so just being creative in ways to save money but still give the animals you're keeping what they need um because not everyone can afford you know the latest and greatest giz gizmos and gadgets so um but we can still provide what they need if we do it creatively i think yes i fully agree with that so that's uh that's the path that i've had to go down for the time being right yeah yeah i love it i mean i would have like the jars themselves is such a creative idea yeah but, but the making the tv into a a fish tank is just fantastic that's yeah. really cool thank you well yeah the jars are another great example because they're about the size of the smallest um exoterra you can buy but instead of you know forty dollars they're five dollars and yeah. I can put them closer together and fit more on a shelf. And um, so that's just one way to yeah. cut costs. Uh, well, I like, I, I like that that wasn't your first thought. Right. Because what that tells me is that those, those things on the background are really important to you. The actual enclosures themselves, not yeah. just the jars, not just selling the animals, but the actual keeping of them is actually yeah. important. No, I always tell everyone if I 
didn't have to interact with anyone, didn't have to post on social media, didn't have to reply to an ad for a lizard, I wouldn't. I would prefer to just be locked in this room with my lizards, not have to worry about selling a baby. But, you know, can't live that way. Have can't to. tell you how many chameleons I have because I don't like selling. Yeah, I wish I didn't oh have to sell. Like, th before this was a hobby, I rarely sold any of the babies I produced because I didn't want to. So um, I would prefer to keep everything, but something's got to pay the bills. So that's how it works. But, yeah, yeah I, I, it's all about the animals for me, for sure. Yeah, if I can get my Peter Bandits to breed, I'm going to keep them for three years at minimum, if yeah. not forever, just to, just to study their growth rate for – prosperity sake and it also shows people how to do that properly but i just i it's something we'll get into a little later that because i i think i would have trouble selling i just it would it would just these are these are my these are my babies my scaly babies mm -hmm. like it's really yeah i and so uh so my next question is Put yourself in one of your animal's shoes for a day and tell me what they're going through. Tell me how they, they go through their day and how, how that feels to them. I think if I was to put myself in one of these lizard's shoes, they're just hanging out, waiting for food, waiting for water, and then, you know, doing their... Th these lizards literally lay an egg a week, so they're breeding a lot. So, I mean, they're wow. kind of living the life. They don't have to worry about predators they don't have to do they're they're pretty intelligent so they after a while you can notice i don't have very many plants in the enclosures because after they get used to you they're not afraid of you anymore and they don't need the cover that they would want to hide from you so uh I think they're, you know, just can living you, life. Can going. you put yourself in one of them that's laying an egg? How it's going? What is, what's it feeling at that time? <laughs> I mean, I've never pushed anything that size out of me, so I okay. can't exact. I would imagine they're built for it. Literally lay an egg every seven to ten days, so it must not be that uncomfortable, but yeah. I can't imagine it would be that comfortable. <laughs> Who knows? Now, I, I'm the guy that tells people that the uh, gnolls, they're they're different in intelligence it's not necessarily that they're smarter than a beardy it's that their their vision of the world is different because mine will actually walk up to the glass my green anoles and actually jump on it mm -hmm. they, they actually know the glass is real yeah and it's they're, it's it's how they interact with it i think on a molecular very, level they're very understanding of three dimensions i would say yeah not only, I mean, they have claws, but they also have pads to stick so they can literally yeah. climb on anything. Yeah, and I actually did a video on do reptiles think in 3D. And I showed my emerald green tree skink running around the enclosure and he would stop for so many and then he would go for so long and then stop. He was literally playing around, jumping off the uh, majestic palm I had in his, in his cage. Right. And so he was playing, but he was thinking in that 3D, mapping his enclosure out. And uh, there was things like that that I, I did. It was really cool. That and do reptiles turn on a dime? No, they actually put thought into their universe. They actually think. Yeah, they definitely yeah. do. Now, what about you, Bill? Can you put yourself in the shoes? Well, that'll be interesting. Uh, I can tell you day in the life of a chameleon is wake up in your uh, little uh, leafy area that you uh, slept in to feel safe climb yourself up towards the uh, the heat lamp warm up till you're done and then just cruise the cage and uh, find a nice comfortable place to sit and watch the world around you and uh, wait for food to come and then uh, stock the food uh, chameleons are very much a, uh, uh, they enjoy sitting around and not doing a whole lot. They are cruise foragers, and so they will cruise around looking for food. They'll cruise around looking for trouble, uh, but uh, they are they are happy, uh, not moving a whole lot. Do you guys ever wonder... Besides knowing the, the where the UVB and the UVA is in the enclosure, that these animals, why do they, they know where it's at and why do they go to it? 
I I imagine what it is is that they're getting that tingling sensation down their their spine like we do when something like that and whenever that kind of goes away is probably when they're like hey okay so maybe it's time to move a little bit that's kind of like I've thought thought about that a little bit that maybe there's a there's a feeling that they get inside that little tingling down your spine so we can relate to it I think just imagine when you're you haven't had lunch yet and you feel hungry or you're walking through you're doing a workout and you get thirsty I mean, I'd imagine it's like the same sensation of your your body telling your brain, hey, you need this. Your body needs this right now, so go do it. So that's how I would, I mean, obviously we'll never know exactly what they feel, but just like when you touch a fire and you're burning, your body says, hey, move away. It's, uh, it's all just, you know, different things telling their brain what to do. And it might be something subconscious as, as I don't know, us breathing. We don't think about it until we're yeah. we're told we're breathing, and now we're all going to start manually breathing. Yeah. But uh, that's that's probably just how it works for them. It's something that they don't even know they need, but they, their body seeks it, and that's why they go look for it. So now the next question is, and this is the last of the format form is, uh, tell me a time when you saw something in one of your animals then you made a change how did that make the animal feel and how might how did that make you feel like what was the two differences here like you're asking you saw something in the animal whether it was a positive or a negative and then you you made a change according to that how did that make you feel like what was your feelings through that and what do you think the animal's feelings were through that well, I did have a time where I had a chameleon uh, go down to the low, be hanging out at the lower end of the cage. And so I turned off the UVB lamp uh, because this was more of a deep forest species. And so it returned back up to the, the perching branch up high, made me feel you felt like how did you good feel on that time that you know, it's part of my job is to watch everybody's uh, response to their environment and tweak the environment to make them happy okay. uh and so i i felt like i had done my job uh as yeah. for how they felt they probably felt more comfortable because now they're not being driven to the lower parts of the cage and so they have all the cage to walk around in. They felt relieved. What about you, Herb, Tom? Um, there were a few times where some pairs of my lizards, uh, different species than I'd worked with before, I couldn't get them to lay eggs even though I was doing everything right. Um, and I did some more research on where they come from, talked to some uh, old timers, if you will, that had been breeding them before me. And uh, they explained to me uh, some changes. And even though they were simple, something as simple as uh, anoles are different than other reptiles where they're laying one or two clutches a, a uh, year. They're literally laying, they, you can, they can lay year round if the conditions are optimal. And like I said, it's every seven to 10 days. So for them not to be laying usually means they're not comfortable in their environment. So but everything was perfect besides the, I didn't give them enough options for laying. For example, now, then I learned I, sh I would give them a drier substrate area and a moisture substrate area to figure out what they prefer because I was just treating them like the, all the others and keeping a little moister. And I found that they prefer to lay in kind of the drier substrate, uh, this particular species. So, um, and then once they found the substrate, they started laying like clockwork. And it's just so interesting to me how the female could control if she was going to lay eggs or not based on if she liked where the eggs would be laid. She didn't want to waste the energy to lay the eggs because she knew they wouldn't be viable in the substrate that was too moist. I'm assuming she calculated this. I'm not sure how, but... How did that uh, make you feel? It, it was... It was 
it always amazes me when I see this with my lizards because I don't understand how they can how they can understand the world around them that in depth, but they somehow do. And it just it leaves me in a sense of that I have still have so much more to learn about them and I want to learn and I just uh it it pushes me to, you know, observe more and kind of pay closer to your attention because that's the whole reason I do this is to enjoy them and learn more about them. So I always support new keepers doing what they, they have to at first, doing what is recommended and then experimenting out from there because we're never going to figure out everything on our own. We, we need people to try to do that. Plus, it makes them feel more connected to the hobby and they're probably going to put more effort into that individual animal. And so right. I, I, it's one of those things that I'm very appreciative of that. And I, I, I don't care how green you are. You really like, I'm, I'm great with it. And like, I love when people work together and it's just, it, it bounds us and it's, it's really great. And it's, it's awesome when your animals like the, the green and all, like my, uh, night and where they were so fighty and, you know, like I was, I was scared that male was going to get my finger off. Like he was like, I didn't realize that holding them, they could still reach around and get the finger. Like it yeah. was like, Oh crap. Are you going to get me? He going to take that finger off. It's like that. now, like I've, I held him last night and even in shed, he didn't like, he tried to bite me once and it wasn't even a big deal. Like it wasn't even that bad. Like it's like when the animals recognize that you are not a massive threat, it just changes that behavior and it just, you could just feel it in the animal. I think Right. it's just a wonderful thing. Um, so going into what you do with the jars, I was going to ask the question, does that at a show, create more empathy for the animal or not and is the answer positive or negative either side of that because even a no could be a positive or negative and a plus could be a positive or negative i i don't know i think it's a quite interesting question and i think it would get people to think about it a little differently how are we showing these animals off that might get a uh more empathy and is that actually good for shows uh lucas bugs does something similar with their bugs and I was really, but it looks like Christmas presents, so it's more focused on, like, like visually stimulating for a human being. Right. I don't know if that's why they did it necessarily, but I thought it was interesting, and they were they're wonderful people, too. So, um, I don't know if it creates more empathy, but it definitely is more appealing to the outsider that's never been to a reptile show. It doesn't look like. You know, I've seen videos of people repost it or like someone that's never been to a reptile show sees a video of a reptile show with a bunch of ball pythons or crusty geckos in deli cups. And then uh, all the people that's never seen it or are commenting, oh, this is so cool. Why would they, how can this happen? Blah, blah, blah. So I feel that not necessarily empathy, but it looks less harsh on the animals because we know that a ball python in a deli cup for a day or two isn't going to harm it but a lot of people don't understand that uh it it's fine um so that's why i do it as well as a lot of the lizards will fire like anoles change colors drastically i'm sure you've seen with, with your green oh, yeah. they go from brown to green within less than 30 seconds so if they're in an in an environment that they are more comfortable in then they're going to fire up and they're going to look more true to life and it's going to be easier for someone to imagine it in their vivarium uh when it's bright green instead of brown just an example but um and then it also gives people something to you know see it across from the, across the show like wow what's that what's going on there and then they come and they'll spend, you know, instead of just walking past the table in 30 seconds, they actually take 10 minutes looking in each jar because they like, where's this one? Where's that one? Uh, and it's just, it's a cool experience. And it lets me be able to keep people there long enough to talk to them about the lizards. Yeah. 
And even if they don't purchase anything, that my whole goal is just to share what I love with other people and selling them is what I have to do to continue that. Yeah. And the jars have been effective. Sorry. Oh, no, you're okay. I mentioned something to Bill earlier. My father worked for Walmarts for quite a few years. And when Walmarts expanded their aisle ways, it made customers so more uh, comfortable that it actually led to an increase in store profits by 10%. But the accesses actually went up 30 some percent. And this is, I mean, comfort is an important thing when we're talking about this. And like you said, when people are there, they're focused on the animal. They're not focused on other things. It, it brings, it, it sounds like comforting a little bit more. And so I think that's, that's interesting. What do you think, Bill? You're the business guy. I think the jars are a wonderful idea because they allow the babies to be sold in a effective environment. Uh, what's all in these jars? So usually it'll be like this way. I use sphagnum moss for the substrate because it's good at holding humidity and usually, you know, doesn't smell bad or anything and it's easy to change. So it'll be a layer of sphagnum moss and then like uh, some either a branch or twigs or whatever, and then a fake plant. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that, uh, what's nice about that is it gives the impression of a naturalistic environment. And so right. the people who are not set up for it are obviously, this is their first impression. And so they get the right impression instead of seeing a screen cage with a one branch and 10 lizards in it and saying, okay, well, this is the baseline. Anything I do better than this is better. And so when they see a nicely done cage where they're individually kept, it uh, sets them off on the right path from the, be from the beginning better. Yeah, for sure. See, I've started making things that actually are made from death molds. So I lost the bearded dragon at at uh, seven months. So this is a a uh, oh god stress ball, and it's actually from the death mold of the bearded dragon. And it was interesting. I was talking to a buddy of mine. It's kind of like uh, people have such separation between this should be okay for a lot of people, but yet for them and a mammal like actually having something a little more realistic is probably too much. It's too much empathy. They're probably not going to enjoy that because they can empathize with it a little more. And then on top of that, it's the, um, if you look at all the cartoonish stuff that you can buy of like a bearded dragon or a Atawaxel or Python, and they're all so cartoonish, and people love them. But yet, if you made more of a realistic one, it might not be so lovable because they can empathize with it a little bit. And that's kind of where I was wondering if the jars themselves would be, if it, if that's actually a thing. So I just. It sounds like the more empathetic we are, maybe the less we're going to buy them, but yet maybe the more we're going to take care of them better if we buy them. I don't know. It's an interesting concept. I'm it, still diving into it. Yeah, it might be like I've heard a lot of times like, oh, wow, I would love to be that little lizard because he, he's got the whole little jar to himself rather than tucked into a tiny jelly cup. But uh, reptile shows, I feel like not necessarily everyone's empathizing with the reptiles because in the end, everything has a price on the thing and stuff, but, um, I'm not sure. I don't know if there's a good answer to your question. I don't, I don't know either. Like that's, I would love to put this question out there to people. And I, I honestly don't know for sure myself, but then it's, it's kind of like, I'm not even sure it needs an answer, but yet it's something to get people to think about it. Right. And I, I like that part of it. Think about it a little bit more. 
also um, thing. There was a couple of things. Uh, there was an. We were talking about perception earlier, and the thing people on the last episode I did the breeder uh, passion of a monitor breeder versus kink breeders. I said something, and I literally said it on the show, and I love those guys. Those guys are amazing. I still talk to them. They are freaking great people. And I said, well, does being a little bit, in, and I said this is done, I'm saying this for the preview to try to get viewers in. So it's, does insanity increase one's positivity in one's passion? Because uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insane, but yet you kind of do when you're a breeder. And like playing football, I compared it to because I really saw the Peyton Manning episode with Tom Brady and their passion was the same as the two breeders I had on. And they were just, it's just such a interesting thing to think about that being a breeder and having that variety in your outcome actually increases positivity in your in your uh, passion in the actual hobby itself but also the fact that it I don't actually believe that we're insane to keep these animals but it's fun it's fun to kind of think oh man I must be a little 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 fruit loopy but no actually idle hands is the devil's work or something like that's the the quote I think you guys know what I'm talking about the devil lives in idle hands and as a reptile keeper you can't be idle so I think this has a positive on our actual mental health. I don't think uh, reptile breeder, if you're doing the same thing and getting the same result, you're either doing something wrong or you're doing something right. You're either getting the good result or the bad result usually. And you're expecting that. So I don't think it's fair to say it's insanity. If, yeah, I don't think so uh, either. Right, because by your definition of doing the same thing, expecting something different, usually you do something, and if it doesn't work, you change it. Or if it does work, you don't change it, and you expect the same result. So uh, a good reptile, I, good reptile breeder, I wouldn't say is insane. <laughs> No, I wouldn't either, quite frankly, but it's still interesting that it might have an increase because of being able to get different results that does it lead to a more positivity in one's passion. What do you think, Bill? I'm going to need a, re a, a, a refresh of that question. You okay? What is... Right, restate the question. So... If, so if you're getting results that aren't always consistent, but yet there's still results that you want, or does that increase one's passion in one's hobby? I imagine the, uh, the challenge is that we don't know exactly what we are getting. We can guide the we can tweak the levers that send us in a certain direction, say for a certain color or a certain uh, characteristic. But uh, yeah, we, we don't know what we're going to get. Even with panther chameleons that are 11th generation captive bred for certain colors, there's still variation that comes out. So uh, it, it certainly gives us the challenge to try to shoot for something, but I think uh, never, truly making that keeps keeps us going yeah see i think that's that's a i i like the way that that sounds i like it way better than insanity because that's where the guys like picked up on like they were like oh yeah you must be a little bit insane and i know like how fun that sounds but yeah it's not i don't really see us as insane i don't oh, think that's the proper I way to not. look at it yeah I, I, I so was saying that I might be insane, but we're, that's a different story. Um, 
the episode on I sent you, Bill, for a reason. The episode on the what kind of people start Facebook groups for reptiles. Uh-huh. It was it was interesting, and I I think you're going to be on board with saying yes, but I still like to. What happened after hearing all their stories and like listening to them and stuff? I really took in that these people like they're because they have good Facebook groups. That what it was that they are good management. They are good management. Leads yeah. to better Facebook groups. Oh, uh, I that that would make sense. Yeah, I think so too. That, that was they, what I kind of pulled away from that. And it's like, and I, I, that uh, was the first thing I thought of was like, wow, what would Bill think of this? Uh, uh. Bill, Bill would think that you have two approaches if you want a uh, to have a Facebook group, and either you let the uh, the inmates run the asylum, and you just let whatever happens happens, and you get these uh, roving bands of warlords going around for. Uh, for doing a power play and figuring out who gets to bully everybody else on the the uh, the Facebook group, or else you have a very strong admin team that keeps order and creates a uh, uh, a police state that says everybody's going to be uh, happy, or else you're out of here. And there really isn't much in between. Uh, but that's... That's yeah. what I have noticed, because whenever you year the admin team does not present a strong presence, there is a vacuum of power, and somebody within the group will rise up to try to take that vacuum of power, and then they will exert their opinions upon the entire group and mold it to their wishes. What I've seen in in these groups is these people managed their and brought on better people, maybe the administrators, and they were really good at managing the administrators to the point that the that they really didn't have to do much with the groups, and the administrators were actually good administrators, and so it was really a like a management system. Yeah, well, as long as they, they have a system that they've set up and everybody knows how to work within it. Yeah, and, uh, I think yeah, that's can be effective. I, I think those are things that we could really take away from that and really do better with Facebook groups. So what do yeah, you guys think of this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's never never perfect in any way. And every single one of those people, just like me, has been kicked out of Facebook groups. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Facebook's a bad place for us. We um, it really is. Facebook that's... is uh, hostile towards breeders, and so breeders cannot talk about what they are doing. And if you any sort of forward movement and development within the community rests upon the breeders, that's how we. Yeah go forward and if breeders aren't welcome on facebook to really be breeders then i mean facebook's a, a toxic place for us we need to be there yeah. to welcome in people new to the community but we, we need a place outside of facebook to really uh spread our wings I fully agree, and that actually is one of those things that pisses me off the worst, is how much information that we have lost. And that's what the two of you do wonderfully with your particular species that you guys actually drive home the actual knowledge of them. And I just absolutely adore you guys for it. Really do. Um, so what's your guys' thought of this so far? The uh, the interview. Is this going? Is, is this, you guys is this like behind the scenes type talk, or are we talking? Oh no! Go ahead. Be as, be as truthful as you want. Like if you think I'm, this is not really uh, like this is shitty. Be be truthful about it. I mean, I'm not. Constructive criticism is always welcome. Criticism, you can go kiss my ass. Constructive criticism, I okay. love it. Somebody criticized me on a video the other day, and I loved it. I mean, because they actually took in 
for the topic that I was talking about and actually put thought into what they were writing and saying. Even though they disagreed with me, they didn't like me, I still respected them for it. When I have other people that go off on, your grammar's bad. I wrote okay. empathy and closures. And if your first thought is your grammar is bad and you didn't like read empathy and closures and thought, what is he talking about? Yeah, you're, you're not my audience. You're probably not a very good person, honestly. Mm -hmm. If your first thought is, well, your grammar is bad, but you overlooked the, the actual concept that was in it. Uh, I, I will say... Every question seems to be going off in a different direction. And so I have had a hard time figuring out where we're going. And so every time there's a new question, it's like we're starting over and I've got to figure out where we're going. So I've had a hard time uh, developing a momentum and going in a certain direction. Uh, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, what about you, Herb Time? Uh on a similar note, uh, I've enjoyed all the questions, but they are kind of uh, all over the place, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But yeah. it can you you kind of, when you're thinking about one thing, and then all of a sudden the conversation switches to a 180. You have to it, it it's not as easy to continue the conversation. I mean, as you've seen, me and Bill have take, taken a few minutes. To, uh, and that's perfectly fine. Think about the questions, which maybe that's what you're going for. Maybe you're trying to get us to think a little more than we're used to on a podcast. But uh, overall, it's been been cool. Okay, so it's it's been has it. Well, let me let me go over what I was doing. So the first question is to understand where your mind's at, to actually understand your language, how you speak about things, so I can better understand the somewhat of your psychology that I possibly can with my limited knowledge. But yet still there's something there. And so then I make sure the other person's listening and then what is the other person focused on? So that's what that ask, having you ask a question to the other person. I want to see where you focus. And then the next question is just to, just to see where your creativity is at. It is literally testing for creativity. And we're going to stack everybody up against each other later. I'll do a summary of this of those questions. And uh, the, the third question is there's, there's two types of empathy. There's putting yourself in other people's shoes. And this is something animals don't really have as far as I'm aware. And so the second question on empathy is the same, animals even have this, being able to feel what the other person's feeling, even if you're not really able to comprehend it, but to be able to say, okay, this animal's feeling this way, so I'm gonna make this change because I think it's gonna lead to a more positive with them or something. Uh, that could be seen as a form of empathy a more base model but yet still a form of empathy and so that's what I'm testing for to see how many in this industry where does it stack up how does it because you guys are amazing so having what this what you do with this information I'm going to summarize it and then put a hypothesis together for anybody that wants to test it more and that's that's it that's as far as I go with it as of what right now. You, what's the high, what are you hypothesizing? Like what's the what's the what's the question you're asking for the hypothesis to be drawn? Well, that's the thing is I'm still learning a lot of these things and there's so many different topics because you guys are so good at business stuff like that and making sure your animals are taken care of and stuff like that. And so like uh, like I talked about the uh, in, you know the breeders and how it creates a more positive in one's hobby is a hypothesis. 
the so there's a lot of them that come out of this that even I may not know and some of them I've already like known I've got uh, Mike Stefani and I'm trying to find a second guest for him to come on and we're gonna do empathy and closures and so we're really testing out that one uh, there's a such thing as conservation psychology I didn't know that was even a thing and I didn't realize that's what I'm doing when I first started this because we have such love for the animals where is our empathy do we need more empathy do we need less empathy if if people don't have the same amount of empathy that you have are they going to take care of the animals as well as you can or vice versa there's there's so many things that I'm just looking for right now to test things and to uh, just move that on well then I will have to trust that you are going to weave this into a beautiful tapestry uh, oh, I pretty much just cut out all the little odds and ends and put it together but I have nothing but positive things to say about you two like still to this day like okay. like there is no wrong answer to these questions if there's wrong answers then your study's wrong because we're actually wanting to get to know you on another level because you guys are the head of this community we are um we're gonna have some people like uh, Phil Gross on eventually and some other people and we're gonna talk about leadership roles like what does it take to be a leader here and I think those are things that we don't think about like you said in the Facebook group so many people trying to step up and take control when they're they aren't actually proper enough they're not qualified to take control and so trying to figure that out and try to breed that out as other things that I'm working on uh, okay. tomorrow I, I actually have an interview with Jeff Brigler uh, Missouri State herpetologist and we're gonna talk about Missouri laws Missouri uh, like the saving of the hellbenders the conservation how do we take that and see if that can be helpful for other people that want to do conservation and things like that and talk about how I might get a law passed and things like that so this will actually uh, there's a law that I would like to see passed where it helps us under like uh, basically you have to get a license to own even a chameleon or an anole uh, but it's like twenty dollars twenty five dollars go to conservation but it but you need to take a test and you need to be able to re, uh, read a light bulb humidity temperature surface and air and maybe some empathy questions so this will help out with that and but once again does empathy really have a role so are you trying to make it so you need a license or is there already a law in place? Uh, I am going to research this for, for a while now and talk to different people because the people that breed often say, and Phil was like, no, I'm not really a fan of this idea, but yet all the rescue people are like, yeah, we absolutely need this. So... I'm not just throwing, oh, well, this this is how it's done. This is what it is. It's like, no, let's study this. Let's see where we can go with this. Let's see what, what we need to learn. Because it's amazing how many people out there can't read a light bulb. And just those little things like that. It would also help people like Viztech. He doesn't have to educate people on the UVA and UVB spectrums and things like that. So those types of things is what I'm really wanting to do. And I, then uh, and when people bring up questions, I take that in consideration and I start thinking about what we could do about it. Uh, somebody brought up that they thought it would hurt uh, breeders. And then it's like, well, if we did a uh, conservation talk where we had conservation people go into middle schoolers and let the middle schoolers take a test afterwards, 
and just middle school. We don't need high schoolers. We don't need it everywhere. Something small, something that will teach the kids how to keep them properly and add more empathy for the animals could be something that would be important. And then that would let the kids be able to get a license. And it's just for the benefit of the animals. And if you can't afford 20, 25 bucks for a license, this is not a regular registration. I don't believe that's the correct path to go down. This is to educate before somebody's able to get an animal. And there could be lots of mistakes, but that's why we're, we're studying this. Uh, in 2024, I may run for Congress or something more. It's not necessarily that I want to. I really don't. Yeah. But I I feel like I have to. I feel like somebody's got to step up. And so if I got into Congress, I would end up taking this information. And so this isn't just me going, oh, well, this is what I believe. This is what I have found to be correct. This is so we actually take that information and we say, OK, conservations of each state, you will get more funding if you put this in place. That's and I think that's super. It is. I, and I, could, I completely agree with having to get a license to own reptiles. I understand. I completely understand where you're coming from for the benefit of the animal. But I think it closes the opportunity to reach people much more than you think because I know when I was young I was I was into reptiles but my parents didn't care but it was convenient to for me if let's just say when I was in elementary school and I got my first snake for Christmas if my parents had to go out of their way because five-year-old can't go get it license I assume my parents would have, and they were busy people, and they were, you know, had a life. They would not have been able to go, and they wouldn't have cared enough to go and get a license for me to own a snake. And I probably wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't get that first snake or the the second ant reptile I had was a leopard gecko. So I, I mentioned it prohibit prohibits a lot. Uh, the the new keeper. I mean, obviously, I would go out of my way right now to go get a twenty five dollar license. But the new keeper, I don't I don't know if that would make much. Sense. I think it would make our hobby harder to get into when we need the opposite. That might be correct. Uh, the other thought that I had, like I said, what if we? Because I was thinking middle schoolers to have the conservation people go into middle schoolers and teach them what they needed to know. So then, then they would just take a test there and it would be free. Yeah. At the same time, I don't think we need to, this is a thing for every single kid in no. every school to do. Not, uh, I mean, it's always fun when, you know, someone brings reptiles to a school and they do a, a uh, informational show, but I don't think, I, I just think the people that want to learn will learn on their own and yeah. it can be definitely a deterrent especially for a parent and yeah uh, oh yeah I most, of this starts, most of us started when we were kids and we would catch reptiles in the backyard and all of a sudden you catch a garter snake or a green and all and now you're breaking the law because you don't have a license for it so it's like uh i think let it, me let me I think it's prohibitive that is an interesting point but Here's what my thinking was to that we don't come down on the people who have reptiles. You come down on the people who sell them. So you couldn't sell to somebody who doesn't have a license. Yeah, but then that, I don't think that works either. I don't know. Yeah, I it's. I don't think it, it's a great idea, but. You never it's kind of, yeah, like there's, there's always going to be issues and you have to balance them out. And so that's what the research is for. That, that's the thing. I've chosen a species. Like I personally usually only am working with and selling species that I would have confidence in selling to a kid that has, you know, some parental guidance. I'm not selling chameleons, for example, which you do need to put in a little more effort. You do need a little more 
stuff going right because they are a little more sensitive. Now I've chosen something that is a little easier. Uh, if you've kept any type of reptile before, you can probably keep one of these. Um, so obviously there's already permits and licenses needed in lots of states for venomous or crocodilians or which makes sense the stuff yeah exactly but i think a broad overarching uh regulation is not what we need i think we if anything we need something where we have less regulation on certain things um that's like I said, opinion. the breeders are usually against it, while the rescues are usually for it. Well, well, so how yeah, do we... of course, because a rescue is obviously taking in animals that weren't taken care of correctly, mm -hmm. and yeah. that. Uh, but I don't sell any animals that are not in proper care. So, yeah, it, obviously, I can see where a rescue is coming from. Just as you know, PETA wants no one to ever breed another dog again. But then Pete is a horrible organization. That is, that is just god not, awful. I'm not equating a reptile rescue to PETA, but I can. They are more like that than they are to a reptile breeder who either does it for a living or is trying to share a species with others. And I think anyone that anything that gets in the way of that is unnecessary, as long as it's not like I said something a life-threatening animal. A chameleon isn't going to kill you, and a null isn't going to kill you. Probably not even break your skin if it bit you. So, I think I'm anti-regulation when it comes to that type of stuff. Because next thing you know, Florida makes another thing illegal, and then yeah, Carolina makes I'm not it a fan illegal. of Florida. Well, uh, what you what you proposed sounds kind of like almost what Florida had in the beginning, which now it's gotten worse. Because yeah. you used to be able to have a tegu or an iguana with a permit, and now you can't even at all. So That's when, not, yeah. when you give when you give the government or anyone, you even give your your a five year old kid leeway with something or give them the power in something, it's only natural to want more power and take more. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Power I, grows I don't, more power. Yeah. Right. So I oh, think I think rather than creating more issues for us i see this as an issue i would i would have okay try to push for more people like me and bill and others to educate with our so rather than i've only been keeping for under two years right so how come i can understand lighting the actual nonverbals of these animals things like that that i've met 20 year keepers that have trouble with it because I have backgrounds in science. I have backgrounds in nonverbal. I have a, I have a degree in physics and chemistry. So I'm actually have similar degrees to me, uh, Ryan McVeigh. So, and then I actually do have studies in nonverbal human communication, which I was able to transfer over to animals to, to learn more about them. So perhaps it is in more in the education outside of herbiculture that we might want to focus on more. What do you think, Bill? Uh, it's a tough one. Would, I yeah, I don't see how that would work. You're going to make people get a master's before they can have a reptile? Oh, no, I, you, don't, you don't even have to go that far. Like, it's not even okay. taking a basic physics course. Like... But this is that's what you do in high school and that's what you're supposed to do in high school. We didn't have that in high school down here. We don't even in no Missouri, I'm sure Florida is probably the same way. Like you don't you don't have any of that. Huh, interesting. No science classes in high school. Yeah, it's if you're if you're lucky, you might get an A P class, maybe. I mean interesting. I have yeah, I don't know about. I mean, I, I, I'm still. I'm only 24, so I was in high school six or seven years ago, and I mean, I I went to a public school and you know did all the normal things, and I have friends in. I went in Montana. I have friends in California, and uh, they all have those type of classes. So I don't know how it is, you know, in the Midwest, but. At least on this side of the country, we have all that stuff. So, 
Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I have no idea. You're not going to be able to regulate uh, the ability to absorb information, and we have way too many people that try to have a an entrance exam before if you, if breeders want to have someone p pass a test uh, before they take an animal and these people study up enough so they can pass the test but they don't implement it so you're yes. not gonna regulation is going to be very difficult and I don't see how it can work, especially since once you establish a structure, that becomes, and a governing structure, that becomes the uh, a very convenient target for infiltration for people who want to abolish it. Yeah. And so uh, establishing policies like that, giving anybody power to make those policies is the biggest weak point that we have. And exactly. It is at the same time a great idea, but it is uh, in a, a tool world. that can be yeah. abused and will be abused. Yeah, in a perfect world, it's a good idea. But like Bill said, the second you make whoever's in charge of that board or whoever's in charge of making the the test for the license, wait till PETA gets a hold of it, it gets someone in power, or not even PETA, just some crazy person, and then they make you all of a sudden you know, have to have a full on, like Bill said, basically a master's degree to pass this test. It's uh, it's, it's amazing it's how much money well, we don't have in lobbying. But this is the reason why it's useful for, why USARC has to fight against even laws that seem a little bit common sense and that yeah. actually do make sense because that is, the, the, uh, the yeah. first step towards something that's a little bit more restrictive, a little bit more restrictive. And this yeah. isn't just paranoia. This is the strategy yeah. that's yeah. employed. That's been the strategy of every government overall of time, you know, and yeah. anyone in power, they, it's baby steps until they finally get to where they want to be. So not only do we need us arc, which is our lobbying, our who lobbies for us, we need us arc to fight for us against the things that are happening but when we have a break as like right now it doesn't seem like we have any huge major legislation coming against us it would be nice if we can be proactive and try to get some legislation written that is for us that's what i want to do too because i would love to see like if i did get into congress if we could actually make laws that might actually lead to more money coming into local politics then perhaps we can get that to shift and actually go to Florida instead of Florida coming to us. So we actually make good laws that go that way instead of those laws coming this way. But like I said, I, I'm not there yet. I'm still working on what I want, but yeah, I know what the, I know what the end goal should be. But how do we get there? Great question. It's a tough question. Yeah. But if nobody tackles it, then nothing ever gets done. And that's a that's a big thing. Like I said, Phil's Phil's eventually going to come on here, and like it's it's really interesting how they actually have leaders in certain states for them. U.S. or Florida? I have just oh my god, I love them. I just, US Arc Florida is just one of the best organizations. And it's, it, it pisses me off to no end when people don't listen to experts that actually put shit together right. That actually, ex like they get a, this massive paper that says the Terrapin is better off being captive bred than just left in the wild and banned from captive breeding. And this is economics. This is friggin' uh, herpetologists. This is like a couple of other like specialists. When you have that, that's it. That should be it. When like that, that is the answer. But but when you look at that and go, oh no, we don't even want to look at that. There, no, no. Then you do not deserve to be in leadership because you are not a leader. 
that just pisses me off to no end. Shit like that is what's killing us in this in this world, not just the country nowadays. Just that refusal to accept that somebody may understand the topic better than you. It's not about understanding, it's about power. Yeah. No it's, like, uh, it's about understanding. And that's the nice thing about me. I'm I'm a friend of mine said it best. You cannot give me compliments and you literally I am the most extroverted recluse you'll ever meet. I guess that's why reptiles cater to me like I love it so well like you guys said I'd rather be around my reptiles but yet if I'm outside I can talk to somebody for two hours that I just literally met I don't care about power that means nothing to me I've passed up management roles because I don't care it's just it's just not important to me so putting people like me in power so I can fix stuff and then leave because I don't want to be there. That's that's okay. where I want. And it's like, yeah, I still I don't want to I don't want to do it. I really do not want to do it. It it actually annoys me that I feel like I have to do it. But we all we all get those feelings. You guys must have had that feeling when it came to the, your reptiles. Like it's like, okay, nobody else is doing this. I have to do this. I have to I have to put these in these jar to make sure that we can do this. I have to put this on this piece of paper so that new keepers can keep chameleons properly. I have to do this. Do you guys think that's that's a good way to sum that up? No. There's always a, a uh, when there's a vacuum of knowledge or resources, there's always a drive to fill that. Definitely. Dude, it's been wonderful, guys. It, I appreciate the feedback. It's really, it, it's fascinating. When I can actually work with other people and talk to them, it's, it increases things. It increases our knowledge, our understanding. So now when a rescue sees this episode, they might go, man, okay, I see where he's coming from. Maybe a law for this may not be the right thing. And hopefully normal people, the people outside of the community, will see these kinds of videos and go, those people seem like really awesome people that I would actually like to get along with. Like they actually seem like they're legit and they're actually caring about their animals. They're not, they're not pieces of trash. They're not like, these are really great people. They're not insane. They're actually more sane than most of us. I, I would like for that to be kind of the takeaway. That's the beauty of this podcast is that 50 years from now, it still applies. Okay. Yeah. So even if I don't catch traction right away, I don't care. It's my money. I'm putting it in there so we can actually leave something. If I die tomorrow, I've left something for the world. I've left something for somebody else to hang on to, for somebody else to learn from, from somebody else to grow with, and they can take it the extra step. And they can take all the credit. I don't give a rat's ass. Uh, the, the lady uh, from Quebec, I told her that she could freely turn any of these in the French that she wants to because it's educational. And I, I mean, just getting people around the world. I'm trying to get a guy on from Mexico who's been down to South America that has saved species in South America. What kind of politics goes into saving species in South America? What kind of person does that? How does language change the way we look at these animals? Those are other topics that I'd like to, to look at. How do you guys okay. think of that? Uh, go okay. for it. Go for it. Now that now that you have a better understanding, what do you think of the podcast now? What do you think of what I'm doing? I still have no idea where you're going with this or what you are trying to create with this outreach. Uh, but being unique is the way to start something new. So... I don't have to understand it. You just have to have the vision and go and run with it and create something. I love that, Bill. 
I actually love that. That was awesome. That's why you're the man of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> that's why, yeah, that's why you're, you're a better podcaster than I am. But yeah, usually uh, the, the episode with Jeff coming up, I've got stuff detailed out of what I want to talk about. Where this is trying to understand you guys, trying to show the world that you guys are actually positive people in this world. That this is, you know, this, and then I can take that information and stack it on top of it, and we can see how much empathy you really need to be a great keeper. How much creativity do you really need? How much of anything? So I, I love that. Like, that's, that's wonderful. You just keep building your vision. And it doesn't matter if anybody else understands where you're going. They will understand it once you've built it. Yeah, I'm hopefully the summary. And then after I do a summary, uh, Dylan from Animals at Home is a friend of mine. And I asked him, once I do the summary, I'd like to come on and talk about it and possibly build a... Uh, because I've done that before where I've actually built a survey and let people take a survey and we can actually, I spent a month on that data. I loved it. When I did the uh, turnover ratio for fast food industry study, a month on the data. I, I mean, I just loved it. I would love to do that study myself since okay. I'm more of a math geek. And then we can have just even more of an understanding, and that's probably where I will announce that particular survey and where to find it, somebody like Animal at Home, and then summarize all of this. Okay. Cool. All what right. What do you think, Herb Time? I think it's cool. Yeah, the podcast is very broad, but since you're just starting, maybe that's a good thing, and you'll, you can channel it into what people like talking about or what topics seem to be most popular or, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes in the beginning, it's good to have, have be wide open so that you don't limit yourself. So things what you're doing and it's, it was, it, it was definitely an interesting conversation. Yeah. I think, uh, the, uh, with Mike Stefani is a very important episode that should be coming up because I love that guy. That guy is an amazing guy too. And to understand empathy and enclosures is a very important topic, I think. And I, I think that's going to lead us down a, especially if I get the guest I want, I think that could lead us to a very uh, interesting understanding and create some new hypothesis to go ahead and study later. All right. Yeah. So yeah. is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Nothing I can think of. No, no. Well, I, I, I adore you guys both. What you guys do is dear to my heart and I have nothing but respect for the two of you. You. If you ever see Thank me you. outside, I owe you a cookie and a hug. Okay. Sounds like a plan. I hope All I'm right. seeing you because I can use the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yeah. And every now and then, some of the stressors of this stuff, I understand we could definitely use hugs sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, so, thank you. All right. Good. Thank you it for was, having us on. It was lovely meeting you guys. Hey, good seeing you again, Aaron. Good to see you. We'll talk. Love your photography. So Thank you. anyway, yeah, I know, right? Like that's. All right. I would love to have start another like... conversation because yeah, I got yeah. to get going. I got to yeah. get ready yeah. for another interview. All right. Well, yeah. thank you guys, and we'll anyway. talk. Can't wait to listen out. Bye all. Bye.